you know, generation earlier. And it seems to me that that doesn't necessarily improve the quality of, of the decisions. On the other hand, you have this huge impact in terms of, of sympathy. I mean, you see somebody starving to death in Africa. If you had seen it in newsprint, uh, you know, it would have been a, an abstraction. But when you see it in color on television, it becomes something that uh, is, is much harder to, to, you know, push aside. How do you assess that? Do you see that as a, a problem for manipulating public opinion as well as something that can be to help people with? Well, I think that overall it's, it's probably a good thing, but it can certainly be mismanaged. I mean, it can lead to, um, as Marvin Minsky was saying, I mean, instantaneous decisions, you know, based on poll numbers going up that you've got to do something when a more reflective kind of thought process would have you know, led you to think of possible, you know, counterproductive, uh, you know, uh, things that you hadn't thought about uh, uh, before. So I think it's, it's something that needs management. Um, the point about this, I think it's simply the case that doubt is not a stable state of mind. It's very hard for us to stay in doubt, and we tend to round things off in a binary yes, no way with them or against them, in particular in response to graphic images on the TV, say, and, uh, and to vote in a poll. We're reacting. We are dealing with a tremendous sensory input and we're giving outputs on shorter and shorter time constants. I remember you told me that you come in and you see 100 emails. Right. And, and you have to react to them. Yeah, but that's good because I have to react to the content. What's very bad is seeing images or hearing sounds or opinions by celebrities that I don't have to evaluate or react. I just react. You to have it. to react to these celebrities on your panel. With that's you. right. <laughs> and so I, was, I think it's quite important to separate out the so the academic concept of a logical process in thought from what really happens to people when they're bombarded by this environment. That's the big scary news. Let's uh, talk about interdisciplinary thinking because one of the characteristics of technology is different fields beginning to, uh, to work together. George, you've pioneered uh, getting yeah. academic institutions, businesses, government, government labs uh, to, to work together. Give us some of your experiences. I think you have to have a focus to all this. So when I started out, uh, I came up with a question in what I'll call thinking. How do you generate wealth and prosperity? And then how do you share it at home and abroad? And I couldn't find any knowledge. <laughs> and so I had to start to do that. And I says, gosh, uh, is it possible to get three sectors to work together? an academic sector to work with the business sector and the both of those to work with the government sector and vice versa. Uh, and I found, yeah, if you have a crisis, it's easier to do it. <laughs> but how do you do it without a crisis? <laughs> Boy, I'd like some ideas on that. Well, do you want to do it? <laughs> of course. Why? Because most, most innovations are, are bottom up, not top down like that. But uh, those innovations don't do very much for you. Humankind. But I must say there are a lot of forces in the modern, you know, academy that, that push in the opposite direction. The complexity of technical knowledge and the volume of it results in this disciplinary specialization that exerts a kind of tyrannical influence over the way people are trained. You'll never find anyone more intimidated than a young professor without tenure because his or her discipline exerts this absolute, you know, control uh, over uh, that, that prevents really any kind of thinking out of the box. So I think that interdisciplinary thinking is, is in many ways got a lot of institutional obstacles in, in our society. And Marvin, how do you see institutional uh, uh, pressures uh, against interdisciplinary thinking? Well, I'm not sure that uh, there's any good generalizations to make. Uh, there's so many different kinds of personalities uh, in young professors, and some of them, you may think of them as intimidated, uh, I would, and, but some aren't, and I'd say that uh, there are some people who don't want to be out on a limb, and they want security, and so they get what they they desire. Have you uh, ever been intimidated? Uh, you don't look it. <laughs> <laughs> Not recently, at least. <laughs> uh, well, I I don't care very much what other people think about me, so it's hard to intimidate me in that sense, unless. Uh, unless it's Richard Feynman or someone, and if he says, you should Especially do more. Especially now, since he's dead. Well, I, it doesn't matter that he's dead. I, I have a very good okay. copy of him. And if I say something uh, too speculative, I can hear and say, well, what would be the experiment for that? Uh, I think the important thing about people is that they get, uh, they get attachments. Their peers, people that sort of imprinted on them, uh, self-ideals, the kinds of things Freud talked about. 
and we each have imprints from a bunch of people. And I know sometimes when I'm writing, uh, I hear the voice of an, another dead scientist, Warren McCulloch, and he says, oh, that's very nice, or that's pretentious. Mm. And uh, what I'm afraid is that with the advance of media, who are the internal mentors built into the minds of our citizens? And it's 98% sports idiots, uh, actresses, actors. Why are actors heroes? Because they're good liars. That's what it takes to be an actor. <laughs> or uh, uh, don't don't mention hosts in that. Uh, uh, well, I actually like some of the hosts, <laughs> but uh, we have this strange celebrity thing, and I think what happens is instead of children being attached and getting values from the right people, if I can <laughs> pretend that we get it from yeah. certain people who have the gift of pretending to be uh, charismatic. Celebrities are celebrities because they somehow make people trust them. Well, this is the result and of, of course, technology. If the, and if it's yeah. an actor, his profession is getting you to trust him when he's playing a role. You can even become to be president if you play it right. <laughs> uh, well, I think that president is a pretty smart one. <laughs> we did uh, that he, experiment. He does all of these things. Yeah, but this is, this is the result of technological amplification. Bec right. Because before technology, you, you wouldn't have yeah, to. But, okay, but before technology, it was your priest or somebody and uh, yeah, but there's some I don't other things. know that we're yeah. still in the same yeah. frying pan or a different yeah. one. But we have to be careful not to take a two-year period or a five-year period and linearize that to the past or the future. Yeah. Frank, uh, as an undergraduate, you majored in classics, your doctorate's in political sciences. D does this give you a different perspective on technology than if you were a scientist or engineer? Well, one thing uh, it gives you a perspective on is that, in a way, the whole technological mindset and the project of modern natural science is something that was deliberately chosen by human societies, you know, four or five hundred years ago. And it does not, you know, it's the it's not the only way of of approaching, you know, social organization and, and you know the pursuit of a, a good life. It's one that we have chosen, but uh, uh, it's not a necessary one. And I think that a lot of people assume that technology has to exist, that technological progress is inevitable and basically a good thing and don't go back to the you know the the premises of this uh, this attempt to conquer nature and whether it's it's really doable and, and uh, uh, you know will provide the kind of meaning that people think that it will How about cross-culturally you, you've looked at different cultures Asian cultures mm -hmm. versus uh, American cultures uh, how do you see technology's effect on different societies is it similar the well, I think similar? I think that it is having the effect of homogenizing everybody uh, for better or worse uh, you know Technology produces modern, uh, you know, economic societies. Certain production possibilities uh, push society. I mean, that's really what uh, you know. When you say that liberal democracy and, and markets are the only way to go, one of the reasons for that is is technological. With information and and the kind of technological world we live in, you have to have political democracy, decentralized economic decision making, and there there's really few cultures that that can stand up against that. Uh, Marvin, uh, you're working on a, a new book, uh, The Emotion Machine, in which uh, I was privileged to read a little bit of the first chapter on, uh, on love. Uh, how do you see uh, perhaps the strongest human emotion, love, uh, uh, being understood in a, an increasingly technological age? Well, people don't like the idea of understanding emotions because uh, there are all sorts of surprises. Uh, that particular chapter starts by uh, describing a person who comes in and says, I've fallen in love with a wonderful person, uh, uh, incredibly beautiful, uh, unbelievably sensitive. I would do anything uh, for that person. And then uh, I translate that. And it turns out that all those sentences are not positive about the other person, but they're negative things about you. You're saying unbelievable, meaning no rational person would believe this. Incredible, same thing. I do anything for that person means I've decided that none of my own goals are worthwhile. <laughs> so uh, then you have to ask, uh, what is the nature of this emotion and how does it work? And uh, it seems to me it's, it's as though a switch were thrown and you're a different computing machine, you're a different thinking machine, and you're using different resources and ways to represent the world. You're seeing things differently. But do you see something as human as love <clears throat> changing because of this technological event? Well, I think that when we understand these things, which we don't want to do, then we might be able to make other kinds of choices. And of course, somebody will say, well, what's the right choice? And I don't know. But I, uh, I, I'd be I, scared if you did. 
Well, but I like the idea of having more options rather than